Hello and welcome to the War, Economy, and State podcast. This is our foreign policy and international relations podcast here at the Mises Institute. This is about monthly, almost monthly, mostly monthly that we do it here. And uh, it's when me and uh, Zach Yost get together and just uh, keep our readers updated on some important issues going on in foreign policy. Uh, and this week, we uh, feel we should talk about the 2023 Pentagon document leaks, which the media is already mostly ignoring. Uh, but if you're the sorts of person, sort of person who likes this podcast and follows foreign policy as we talk about it here on Mises.org, uh, or maybe on friendly websites like antiwar.com, places like that, uh, it's, uh, it's an important issue and should not be ignored. Uh, but for for those at home who uh, just want the basic details on it, uh, you may remember that in April 2023, so last month, started to hear about these leaks of information from documents that uh, were classified at the Pentagon, and what did these documents say? Um, they had a lot of information about uh, U.S.-Ukraine relations and uh, the, the war in general, as well as, however, even some relations between the U.S. and Egypt and South Korea and uh, some other related issues. Uh, but it turned out, though, hilariously, is that these documents had actually been floating around online for quite some time and that they had been allegedly posted by a person named Jack Texera, an airman of the Massachusetts Air National Guard, a so very low-ranking guy, about 21 years old. Uh, and he had posted them on a Discord server, and they were being discussed in Twitter, Telegram, and 4chan. And that people had been reading them for months. They just hadn't been widely discussed outside of these particular groups Online, But then they started to get posted other places, and then the geniuses at the Pentagon realized that these documents had been leaked and had been online for quite some time. And uh, so the Pentagon's allies uh, in the media, uh, the mainstream media, got to work trying to find who had leaked these documents and basically did a lot of the... Uh, uh, the U.S. intelligence state's work uh, for it, uh, tracked down this guy... Uh, he was arrested. Who knows now how long he'll um, rot in jail or prison. Um, there hasn't been much news yet about the charges and, and when he might be awaiting trial. Uh, but uh, so that's still there. Young man whose life is now ruined uh, by this. Nevertheless, let some information out that uh, some of it looks pretty darn reliable and tells us a little bit more about how things work at the Pentagon and just how badly the U.S. mismanages a lot of its relationships with its own allies, how it's spying on its own allies, how um, it's shelling out uh, foreign aid money to uh, to its allies who are then working with Russia and so on. And Zach will cover a lot of those details here. And so that's the basic rundown of that. So it's been about a month now since uh, it was it was news, and there's still a lot more to know about what happens to Jack Texera. Uh, but this just leaves a lot of questions about, okay, why was he in a position to leak these documents? And then what does this tell us about American foreign policy? So, uh, Zach, I guess really we could just start off with some of the basics here. You've got a list here of what you think are some of the most salient issues. So why don't we just get right into it about what you think are some of the most important bits of information learned from these these leaked documents, and we can kind of just go from there. As you mentioned about U.S. allies, this to me is just sort of hilarious in like a dark way, like most U.S. foreign policy is full, full of dark humor. So uh, the U.S. since uh, 1946 has given Egypt $85 billion, and nowadays it's about $1.3 billion a year. And these leaks, and these, I have not seen these documents, but it's been reported by a whole bunch of other places. Because uh, as you said, the doc there was not just one leak. These This guy was just putting them on Discord, and then they just disseminated all over the place. But um, the military dictator of Egypt, basically, it's uh, one thing these leaks seem to show is we just have intelligence 
agents everywhere because we know so much about what's happening in internal administrations of all these countries. But basically, the military dictator of Egypt was trying to arrange to sell 40,000 rockets to Russia. And he's like, we have to do this carefully so the U.S. doesn't find out, you know, we have to route them carefully. Well, apparently someone sitting in on the meeting is on the U.S. payroll or we have the room tapped or something because we knew right away. So that's just absurd right right off the bat that, you know, we're we've provided over a hundred billion dollars to Ukraine and this other country we've given 85 billion dollars to over the years is actively working against us even though we write them a big check every year although that check is mostly so they can then buy American military equipment so really it's a convoluted rent-seeking scheme but still that's infuriating. Another thing is that the United Arab Emirates was going to uh, op open some sort of Russian um, military equipment repair facility. And I think this would be related to Russian equipment in Syria, uh, where uh, uh, Russian and American planes have been like playing chicken recently. So it's just sort of like the UAE we just sold them $23 billion in military equipment in uh, at the beginning of 2021. So it's just sort of like uh, they're just stuffed with American equipment and we can consider them, oh, such an important partner in the region. We facilitated there in Saudi Arabia's, uh, you know, horrible, disastrous war in Yemen for so long. And it's just like, this is <laughs> this is how our friends repay us, friends in quotes, uh, you know, is the, I mean, it's it's almost insulting <laughs> just uh, the, the way in which the U.S. Is, is being used here. And one, no one seems to care. And two, like the government, uh, I don't even know what they just. Uh, I, I doubt we're not going to cut Egypt its check. Right. I mean, and that, yeah, that should be just some additional context here, right? Is uh, just remember every time the U.S. claims to be on the side of democracy and freedom, just remember the U.S., uh, one of its top recipients for decades has been Egypt, the military dictatorship, uh, whose economy is heavily dependent on military spending. Like the military is the number one employer. It's, it's a military state. Um, certainly, uh, the Christians in Egypt suffer horribly at the hands of uh, the allies of the ruling regime there. I mean, it's just uh, a, a, an awful, awful regime. I wouldn't much like to live under the United Arab Emirates either. Uh, certainly not exactly a friend to Western civilization, but yeah, another paid off ally of the U.S. Uh, so let's uh, let's get over this idea that the U.S. is only friends with uh, <laughs> with uh, de democracy loving re regimes, not to mention the Saudi regime, which at least until recently was firmly in the pocket of the U.S., although uh, they're now working with Iran uh, and China. Now, on the the military base thing with Russia now. Russia, unlike the United States, doesn't have very many bases outside of, they're very near abroad, right? They have a refueling, they have a small base really on the coast of Syria. Uh, and they've been in negotiations trying to do something with Vietnam, and that always just seems to get pushed farther into the future. So what, what was this plan with UAE? Uh, was it going to be a place in the Persian Gulf where they would have a base? I wasn't quite sure on that. I think it was just uh, the UAE was going to repair Russian equipment. Like, it wasn't going to be, like, a military oh, okay. base type thing. But it's just, like, <laughs> they're facilitating uh, someone we're, we're literally, like, playing chicken with with fighter jets right now uh, in Syria. I mean, Syria is a whole mess we should leave, of course. And then, uh, I, you know, Russia and Syria and the UAE can do whatever they want. But it's the point is, <laughs> is that we're, we're being played for suckers here. As John Mearsheimer says, the U.S. is Uncle Sucker. Uh, so it's, uh, that, it's just annoying, insulting. Well, isn't what really matters that these regimes continue to get money so they can buy American weapons? I mean, you hinted at that. Isn't that the real purpose of it all? Yeah, lots of the military aid, it's, it's not like we just give them a pallet of cash or something. It's they're basically vouchers to buy, you know, tanks or whatever that employ 
people in important <laughs> congressional districts in their manufacture and things like that. Um, I mean, this is well known forever that the Pentagon uh, places basically uh, various, you know, military factories and all their various subcontractors and all that in <laughs> important congressional districts so that they have leverage over Congress. Like, we can't cancel that program. You'll lose 500 jobs in your district. Uh, I mean, this is why the... Um, uh, the, a the uh, uh, what is it, the AC-10 Warthog, which is that really cool plane. It has like a giant uh, auto cannon, uh, but it uh, it's sort of been agreed now for years and years and years that it it's not would not be really feasible in a modern war. It'd be shot down immediately. Like people have said, we should give these to Ukraine, and it just sort of like it would not last five seconds. Uh, uh, just like this kind of ground attack plane, but it's still there because uh, you know um, they've just kept a lock on uh, that congressional district and everything. And I think the current. Uh, representative of the district that the they're based in was wa was a pilot for them too. So it's <laughs> just you know that'll probably be around for a while too, even though I mean of no use. Well, on that issue of like spreading out military spending across congressional districts and stuff, there's actually for those who are interested on how Congress schemes to keep spending going no matter what uh, through that mechanism. There's a good book on this called The American Warfare State, The Domestic Politics of Military Spending by Rebecca U. Thorpe. This came out, I don't know, like nine, ten years ago. Uh, it looks like it's basically like an expansion on her Ph.D. dissertation or something like that. Uh, but I would recommend it just to just to learn how that mechanism works if you're interested in like the domestic politics side of military spending um and just <laughs> and how they keep it going right why no one ever seems to oppose it and no one ever wants to want an actual cut in military spending it's not just ideological i mean it's like built into the whole congressional spending system so just for if you're looking for a book to read uh you want you know something uh something deep in the political science files uh there's a book for you um now one of the other big issues was the the Pentagon's opinions and plans and assertion of what's going on in the uh, Russo-Ukrainian war? So what's what's been their predictions there? Uh, it it sounds like it's not nearly as triumphant uh, internally at the Pentagon as we hear in the media about how how glorious the uh, Ukrainian victory will seem. If anyone's paid any it. attention to the news, they've probably heard of the looming Ukrainian counteroffensive. They've been talking about it for months and months and months, uh, usually in the context of how we're sending them billions of dollars of more weapons, so they'll be ready for this counteroffensive. And uh, there's all this speculation about what, where it will be, when it will be. Like, one of the main goals is... They want to sever the land bridge between Crimea and uh, the, the rest of the area in the Donbass that Russia captured, and then, of course, Russia itself. And um, so this, again, is one of the documents I did not see, but the Washington Post has its hands on it, and it dates from early February, and it basically says... Uh, yeah, we don't think this counteroffensive is going to accomplish much. Um, uh, uh, it, the Washington Post says the uh, it's forced generation and sustainment shortfalls, and that quote basically they the best they can hope for is will result in quote modest territorial gains. Um, and so, yeah, as you said, of course, there's all this, oh, the Ukrainian military is being built up so much, and it's going to, you know, uh, with all this Western aid that we've just been pumping into the country, is going to launch this counteroffensive. And um, I've been, even before these leaks, I was like, one, is this counteroffensive even ever going to happen? <laughs> like, it, one, will it happen, uh, or will, will if it does happen? 
quote, happen will just be like an online counteroffensive where the level of the counteroffensive has started and <laughs> nothing actually changes on the ground. Um, and it's worth noting, the Ukrainian military did take back lots of territory last year. But uh, part of the reason is because the Russian military, uh, I don't sort of, I have no idea what they're doing. They invaded Ukraine when, like, the, the general rule of thumb is you need a three-to-one ratio of attackers to defenders. Well, they had below a one-to-one -one ratio when they invaded Ukraine. Um, and there's speculation that they basically had thought they'd bribed enough people. Like, that's how, like, Kherson fell rapidly is, like, the administration there apparently, like, was on the Russian side and stuff. And in other cases, it just paid people who just didn't <laughs> follow through and various other things. But still, it seemed very crazy. So these, uh, sort of that northern sector around uh, Kharkiv or Kharkov, um, th there was barely anyone there, basically. In contrast, after that happened, Russia began, uh, they uh, instituted uh, their call-up of reserves and all that, and they've been fortifying. I can't remember if it was Reuters or who was just talking about how... <laughs> Uh, Russia's been fortifying all over, basically, the front lines. And also, the other thing is, the whole front line is mined to heck by both sides. Um, so, uh, I've read some people speculating Ukraine would have to do mine clearing before they could even launch their own counteroffensive. But anyway, so the, the U.S., the Pentagon is skeptical that there'll be some great success with this counteroffensive. And that uh, big part of it is, you know, generating enough uh, trained people and enough equipment for the offensive to follow through. And this I have seen uh, documents on. So let's see here. The um, one of the leaked documents. So here's here's sort of the thing. The the guy, he's the uh, Sam or uh, what was his first name? Uh, Texiera, whatever. Uh, Jack, Jack, right? Um, he started by transcribing all these documents, and then he'd post them as text to this Discord server. And then he's like, well, this takes forever, and you guys aren't even reading it. <laughs> and so then he just started taking pictures on his phone, which is how, I guess, the New York Times <laughs> sort of got onto him because they found his countertop uh, that was in the background of uh, uh, some of the pictures. Anyway, so some of these documents are crinkled and hard to read, but, but anyway... There's this one document that breaks down the Western training of the brigades that are supposed to engage in the counteroffensive. There's supposed to be 12 brigades, three of which are going to be trained and equipped by Ukraine. The other nine are going to be trained and equipped by the West. And it goes through each of the brigades. And for each one, it has... Uh, like a percentage of training complete and a percentage of equipment on hand. So this is from uh, February 28th is, is when this leaked document was compiled. And there are um, three whole brigades that, uh, no, four, five, five whole brigades are marked at 0% trained. So that's the end of February. And they're all supposed to be trained. It, it, it has uh, that there's supposed to be nine trained brigades by April 30th. So the best case scenario, they went from 0% to 100% trained in two months, which is seems unlikely. But also, lots of these brigades, uh, the, none of them, as of February 28th, had 100% of their equipment on hand. And they're just, it, they're stuff from everywhere. American stuff, uh, German, French, British, just all this, it's sort of, as I said before, scraping the bottom of the barrel to get this counteroffensive force together. But here's what, to me, is really crazy, is the U.S. Pentagon doesn't think it's going to really accomplish much of anything. 
So if they don't think it's going to accomplish much of anything, and we're, you know, throwing together everything we can, you know, get our hands on for this, that's not going to accomplish anything. What is the point? What is the purpose of this whole <laughs> operation? I mean, it seems it's just going to get a bunch of people killed and a bunch of, you know, gajillions of dollars of equipment destroyed, and the war will basically continue on as before. So I'm, a part of me, I, I wonder if the counteroffensive will even happen. Um, and there are some other logistical things we can get into as well regarding artillery shells and anti-air defense, but it's just, uh, it might happen. I mean, and who knows? The future is radically uncertain. It could be a resounding success because of Russian incompetence or something. I don't think that's likely, though. So it seems there's no plan here other than throwing money and Ukrainians who have been uh, chain-ganged or uh, uh, shanghaied off the street uh, into the meat grinder with no end goal in sight. Well, and of course, it's very much uh, already there's a online counteroffensive, if you want to count it that, because, right, most days I go and I just look up Bakhmut, right, because that's that seems to be where the focus of the war is at the moment, is the, the war over the, the city and region, the ruins of Bakhmut, basically, at this point, and so... If you just look at the headlines every day, it's always stuff about, oh, Ukraine says it's regained a few neighborhoods in Bakhmut, or Russia says it, it's advanced, it has almost surrounded Bakhmut. You'll occasionally see videos, and it's always just videos of Ukrainians killing Russians. You never see, of course, videos of the reverse, because uh, I guess we're just supposed to believe Ukraine is just going from success to success in the region. And then the, it just throws out these numbers, like 100,000 Russians killed in Bakhmut alone. And, I mean, I, I have no idea, right, where, how, just how far off that number is. Because, as even the Pentagon admits in these leaked documents, is it's what they're ascertaining, uh, how they ascertain the situation has nothing to do with what's reported in the media in terms of what's likely and what's going on in the region. And they are, if you look, they're already talking about a Ukrainian counteroffensive like happening. And I guess some piece of it is happening. That I, The word is being used. Ukrainian counteroffensive regains parts of Bakhmut and all of that sort of stuff. But Looking at the reality of it, there's so little change because I've been I've been checking in on Bakhmut for months now and nothing's going on except just more people being killed and more buildings being leveled and that sort of thing. In this document uh, from like the end of February, the U.S. military's analysis is like, oh, Bakhmut is like over <laughs> like the, the Ukrainians are done for. Uh, but here we are still uh, two months later. So, um, yeah, I had thought that it would be over much sooner than now. And some people uh, I've read have speculated that they're just, uh, Ukraine is continuing to feed people into Bakhmut basically to prevent, uh, basically just to hold, like, the everything there until they launched their counteroffensive. But who knows? I mean, it could also be some sort of just non-material, more like a point of morale of like, we can't lose Bakhmut. We've been fighting for it for so long. Um, I don't know. Well, it seems that from the American perspective, it's it's win-win in a certain way in that you just keep spending money, keep using up arms that have to be replaced. And as long as you're not throwing a bunch of Americans into the meat grinder, most American voters aren't even going to notice or care or have much interest in it at all. But you can keep the, the money flowing in a big, big way. And then it all just works out for the, <laughs> the American warfare state perspective. And so I don't see why they would change their policy at all now. I mean, it would take, I mean look, at, look at the U.S. support in, of Yemen, right? Nobody cared. And so just just keep going. Now, you can already see that Americans just don't even care about the war anymore. Yeah, on Twitter, there's the people devoted to shouting down anyone who uh, supports the war. And there's polls 
of course, online. There's plenty of Eastern Europeans online who have strong opinions about it, but, but they don't vote in the U.S., and, uh, and ordinary people aren't paying any attention to those people. Yes. Well, <laughs> Although they that's do another find topic we can talk about another tanks. time is, so, yeah, just how much influence, influence some of these groups conduct, do have so. managed to have in U.S. think tanks um, and, and tell people, certain people to shut up for uh, uh, opposing the war uh, too much. But, of course, you can't take any of these people seriously. I mean, Poland was one of the most enthusiastic supporters of the U.S. invasion of Iraq, as uh, as was Ukraine, and sent plenty of soldiers to go kill uh, Iraqis, but now suddenly have discovered their love of national sovereignty and uh, territorial borders. Um, but so forgetting about this part of the world, right, there's stuff in these leaked documents, too, about Asia and the Pacific. Is there not some stuff to do with the the South Koreans? And oh, oh, South Korea. Yes, yes. This the is the Five <laughs> Eyes and and all of that. Quite uh, interesting. I, so um, the U.S. has uh, just uh, giant caches of military equipment around the world. One place is in Israel, another place is South Korea, and the U.S. has been pulling our American-owned equipment out of these places in order to send to Ukraine. But South Korea is a sort of like a military manufacturing powerhouse, um, uh, as you might expect, given their sort of situation with North Korea. And so they have tons and tons, apparently, of, um, of uh, uh, 155 millimeter artillery shells, which, uh, let me pull up the latest fact sheet here, the U.S. has sent, I think it's one point, uh, yes, uh, over 1.5 million 155 millimeter artillery rounds to Ukraine. Um, and we can talk about this later. Ukraine basically has no artillery shells. Um, but so South Korea has this giant stockpile. And so we've been trying to pressure the South Korean government to send these shells to Ukraine, specifically 330,000 of them. And the issue, uh, well, I, it's my understanding that by law, South Korea cannot provide lethal military aid. And there's some sort of attempt to lift that law. But so how it works with military sales, it's not like you just, you know... I go down and buy a car, and then I can do whatever with the car. I could sell the car to my neighbor. With military equipment, there's end end user inspections and all this stuff. Uh, and you might recall way back sometime last year, everyone was like freaking out at Germany because all these countries wanted to send some artillery to Ukraine, but there was... German artillery is like East German artillery, really. And Germany was not granting them approval to do that, and then they did and stuff. So uh, there's this, it, it, going back to how we apparently have spies everywhere, like the documents list basically <laughs> everything, the entire like breadth of the policy conversation in the South Korean... Um, uh, administration, uh, but like this guy says this and this person says this. And someone was like, we can't be on the phone with the president of the United States until we know what we're going to do for this. And so, uh, basically there's, they were thinking maybe we can just send this stuff to Poland and Poland can break the rules and we'll just wink, wink, nod, nod. And Poland will send the artillery shells to Ukraine. And actually one of the documents has like this sheet of like, <laughs> like breakdowns of like, if South Korea agrees, here's how we can get the shells, like by when the shells can get to Ukraine and stuff. Um, and this, I have not, I've not seen anything else on this and it was not like an announcement. It was like a, like a leak of like, oh, this is going to happen. That South Korea was going to loan the United States half a million uh, 155 millimeter artillery rounds. Um, 
No, exactly. I mean, I guess how that would work is <laughs> is that the U.S. would just then have these on hand and could we could then give another half a million rounds to Ukraine. Although, going back to our earlier episode... Uh, oh, here it is. Um, at current production rates... Um, uh, this is from that CSIS report. We cannot rebuild the inventory because all of the production of artillery shells in the U.S. are used just for training purposes. <laughs> so it'll be years and years till we could repay that loan to South Korea if that were to actually happen. Um, there was also other stuff about uh, China launching a hypersonic missile and stuff like that. I mostly paid attention to the Ukraine-related stuff. But yeah, it's just we have <laughs> intelligence penetration everywhere. I mean, people, it's just their job to write up these reports of, like, what the spies have sent in, I guess, every day, of all the office gossip in the various White Houses or their equivalents around the world. Well, and uh, of course, it's always a funny reminder of Americans act outraged whenever they find out some other country is spying on the U.S., um, as if the United States respects the, uh, the the privacy and security of other states. Right, and this was another leak that was pretty funny. It was It's not in the documents I've seen, but it's been reported on that Serbia has actually sent military equipment to Ukraine, um, which, of course, would be scandalous there, because the Serbian population in general is very pro-Russian, but the government is not. I mean, they're sort of surrounded by NATO and all that. So if true, that's just sort of hilarious. And also we've just screwed them over because we probably had to twist some thumbs to <laughs> get them to do that. And uh, there's also outrage in South Korea over this of like, oh, are you spying on <laughs> the president and, and all that sort of stuff? Well, that was always that's always been a point that Lou Rockwell makes is that the government lies about everything, but they lie extra about foreign policy. Uh, you you can rely even less on what they say when it comes to wh whatever they're they're telling you they're doing with other regimes or whatever the position is, and this is true anywhere in the sense of what the especially the Serbian regime is just a perfect example of this, right? What they say one minute to appease the local population could be absolutely the opposite of what they say behind closed doors to leaders of other states, and. Uh, and it's it's just how I remember when we saw like Lindsey Graham fist bumping with the the current vice president over some dumb law that they had joined forces on and so on, right? Is that when they're when they get together at their cocktail parties and diplomatic meetings, it's their club and they're making promises to each other uh, that may or may not have anything to do with what they're telling the public uh, in public places. And so it's uh, it's just this is all just a reminder that you cannot believe anything that you get out of the regime in terms of what's going on in Ukraine, in terms of what the Pentagon thinks is feasible. I mean, who knows? You you might get a good sense of it 10 years after the fact, after the historians do their work or maybe when there's a leak and things like that. Um, and so it's just always interesting to see these leaks. Now, I haven't seen quite the same level of hysteria over Jack Texera that I've seen over, say, like Edward Snowden or Julian Assange, that they're traitors and need to be hanged and they're endangering Americans and all of that sort of thing. I haven't seen a whole lot of claims here that these leaks endanger the lives of Americans. I wonder if that's just progress being made or just that because the public just simply is totally uninterested now. I don't, I don't know. Um, but it is... It is interesting to see, I think, some changes over time in terms of how people react to these leaks. Not that that would, not that that helps you any when you're on trial for violating uh, <laughs> these federal laws about uh, leaking classified documents. But uh, it's most of the the public doesn't even know who these people are after a few years, right? Like reality winner, right? And there wasn't, you know, um, Edward Snowden had like a dramatic escape to Russia, <laughs> and Julian Assange was stuck in the embassy for, uh, you know, I don't even know how, a long time, and he's still in prison and all this stuff, uh, whereas uh, Jack 
one, I think he's somewhat a sympathetic figure. I mean, in that he's like a kid, basically. I mean, it's it. The I think it was the Washington Post or was the New York Times interviewed some other people from this Discord server. And Jack, who was 21, was the oldest person on the server. Everyone else is basically teenagers. So he was leaking these classified documents to teenagers, basically, who were his friends. And one of the teenagers that was interviewed by one of the newspapers uh, said, you know, I'd go to jail. I wouldn't rat on him <laughs> to the government. I'll talk to you, though, the reporters. But he's like, I'm going to... And then, then the reporter asked him why, and he's like, because he was my best friend. And that made me feel very sad. It, it, it sort of speaks to the alienation and loneliness of, well, everyone, but especially youth these days. It's like... I think some of the people met in person a few times, but it's like basically an online friend, uh... And that's your only sort of, uh, you know, companionship is quite sad. I mean, but also it sort of helps him, I think, in that he didn't do it for principled reasons. It doesn't help him at all when it comes to on trial and all that. But I guess in the public perception, if you do it, if you're a principled leaker, like I'm leaking these documents because of the government's horrid, you know, whatever it's doing, then people can disagree with those principles. But Jack didn't really have any principles <laughs> behind what he was doing. It's just, oh, here's this dumb young kid doing dumb young kid stuff. Uh, I mean, some kids get drunk and drunk drive and crash and kill someone and their lives are ruined. He leaked government documents. Um, so I, I don't know. Also, the news cycle is just so fast now that looking back to like the Edward Snowden and uh, Manning and all that stuff, like, those, that was, like, top news for, like, weeks, if I'm remembering right, you know? <laughs> now it's just something new. It's just, the news cycle is so rapid, it, it, it drives me nuts. Well, and of course, uh, if you're 19 now, you spent two years of your youth locked up and unable to go to school and meet people in person, depending on which state you lived in. So, thanks. And that's right. This discord started during COVID. Yeah. So an unintended consequence of uh, <laughs> uh, Fauci uh, lockdowns and all that. We talk so much about unintended consequences, trade-offs. Well, you know, kids might get lonely and start leaking classified documents. America's so. alienated youth are now leaking documents <laughs> to impress their what few friends they have. Yes. Um, and yeah, who wants to see this guy locked up for the next 20 years? Uh, as you note, right, you don't even have to prove intent, though, with a lot of this federal law related to this stuff. In a, in a sane world, you have to prove that he would want to do harm to the U.S. regime and that sort of stuff. But they don't really have to prove that on trial to uh, to, to send this guy away for years and years. Um, but that's probably going to be the sad outcome. But uh, if, uh, surely there's someone's out there printing free Jack Texera buttons and you should, you should buy one, support his legal defense fund uh, if you have the means. But on that sad note about the youth alienation, we should probably end this episode of War, Economy, and State. Thank you for listening, and we'll be back uh, about next month or so with a new episode, and we'll see you next time. Mm -hmm.